We're starting with the nose, and in the nasal cavity, you have these folds. These are called the nasal concha. And uh, it, the term isn't as important as knowing what it does. So as air comes into your nose, it's coming in at a really high speed. And we need to do a few things with this air before it can get down into your lungs. And one of the things we need to do is slow it down so that we can clean the air. So inside the nose, you know, you've got hair, you have mucus, and as the air comes in and hits those nasal concha, it kind of causes the air to swirl. So it stays in the nose for a little bit longer, all right, because of that swirling, and allows the cleaning process to occur. Now something else that also happens due to the swirling is that the air is going to be warmed up. Underneath the surface of the nasal epithelium, we have really large veins. Uh, these are actually called venous sinuses. They look like little sausages. They're so stuffed with blood. That's why, you know, you get hit in the nose. It's so easy to get a bloody nose because you've got these big veins right there uh, that can rupture. Now, because you have this vein that has a lot of blood in it, Whenever blood comes in, it kind of slows down and sits in that vein for a while before it goes out the other end. And blood radiates heat. Now, where we get the heat from in our blood is that every single chemical reaction that we do in our body, one of the waste products is heat. And that heat, if it builds up in our system, we're going to overheat. So the heat goes into our blood and then the blood transports it closer to the surface of the body so the heat can radiate off. And of course, one of the places it's radiating off is inside the nose. And so we're going to heat the air as well. So we're cleaning the air, we're heating the air, and then we're also humidifying the air. And we just talked about this. I told you that wherever you have excess blood hanging out in a vessel, there's going to be an increase in pressure. And anytime you have an increase in pressure, some of the fluid is going to get pushed out of that vessel into the tissues. Well, in this case, fluid is being pushed out of the vessel and it's being pushed into the nose cavity and it's like it's, you know, just misting inside the nose. And so your air is going to be 100% humidified. That means it's just packed. 100% full of water as it enters into the nose. So we are warming the air, we're cleaning the air, and then we're also humidifying the air. The lungs are very sensitive tissue, very sensitive. Matter of fact, you can think of your lung tissue kind of like uh, tissue paper. Okay, you know how thin tissue paper is. And now imagine tissue paper a thousand times thinner. And that's how thin your lungs are. And your lungs cannot take a lot of dirt and things getting in there before they start to tear. And they also cannot handle it when it's too cold or it's too dry. And you've probably experienced this if you've ever been outside and it's really cold, it's really dry, and maybe you're running around and breathing in through your mouth a lot where there's no humidifying the air going on in the mouth like it is in the nose and your lungs start to hurt after a while. And that's because you didn't warm the air up appropriately. You didn't put enough water into the air. And if you do expose your lungs to this really cold, dry air for too long, too much, uh, you can cause damage. And uh, some people end up getting like pneumonia, things like that. So very important, clean the air, humidify the air, and also heat the air as it goes through the nose. Now, at the back of the nasal cavity, there's actually a little lymph node that sits here. There's also a lymph node that sits at the back of the tongue and in the back of the throat, just in case we have to breathe through the mouth. These lymph nodes are also there to help to clean the air, and uh, what they do is they catch bacteria and viruses. Uh, the one in the back of the nose, in the back of the nasal cavity, we call this the adenoid. So if you've ever heard somebody has to have their adenoids taken out. The ones in the back of the throat, these are called tonsils. They're really lymph nodes. They just get special names because of where they're located. Uh, but they're there to filter out bad guys, bacteria, viruses, so on. Now, once air gets through the nose or gets through the mouth, either one, it's going to go to the back of the throat, which is your pharynx, and then move to the front into your larynx and then down into the trachea. Now, I want you to notice this setup. 
Your larynx and your trachea are to the front. Your esophagus is to the back, okay? So when we talk about the digestive system, kind of keep that in mind. The esophagus sits right behind the larynx and the trachea. So the air is now going to go into the larynx. And this is the setup of the larynx. There's a couple important things about the larynx you need to know. One, the big deal, is in the larynx you have vocal cords. So as we exhale, the air that we're exhaling are going to hit on these vocal cords, this connective tissue, and cause it to vibrate. And as those vocal cords vibrate, they create a particular sound. Now, the sound of your voice is also due to the fact that you have sinuses in your skull. The air swirls in there and that creates a certain sound for your voice and your vocal cords in the back of your throat, the back of your cheeks, they all create a particular sound, which is also why when you hear your voice, like you know somebody's recorded your voice and you're hearing it, it doesn't even sound like your voice to you because your voice is resonating all in your head and it sounds totally different to you than it does to someone else. Uh, and maybe if you have like a sibling or you know maybe your mother or father or something like that, you may sound very similar in voice to them. Like uh, you know the new cell phones where you can just talk to Siri without pushing a button. Uh, every single one of my kids, uh, uh, my female children, can all get my cell phone to turn on by just saying, hey Siri. It's like, dang, we must all really sound very similar because Siri has absolutely no idea who's talking to her. So it's really very interesting and it's because of the genetics, things are going to be shaped very similar from one sibling to another uh, within a family. Now, in order to change the pitch of the sound of somebody's voice, what we have to do is we have to change those vocal cords. Now, a couple of different ways to do it. Notice, okay, so right here in this overhead, this is a picture of the vocal cords right here. Mm -hmm. And in front, we have the thyroid cartilage. In back, we have the arytenoid cartilage. Now, those aren't really important except for you to know that the vocal cords are attached to these two cartilages, okay? And the arytenoid cartilage kind of reminds me of, you know, like the arm on a slot machine. You can pull it back and forth. And we have the ability to pull this cartilage back and forth. It's actually attached to skeletal muscle. And you can pull that cartilage back and forth. And what it does is it stretches and releases your vocal cords. And every time you stretch it, the pitch of your voice goes up. And when you release it, the pitch of your voice goes down. So if you want to sing real high pitch, you're going to stretch those vocal cords out. And if you want to sing lower pitch, you're going to release those vocal cords. Now, you and I don't even think about it when we do this, and we do this all day long because obviously we're talking, but this has now become reflexive. So if you're ever watching a little baby learn to talk, you'll see you know, they're making all kinds of weird sounds. It's because they're learning how to control those vocal cords as well as you know, some of the uh, muscles in the throat to like make the g sound and things like that and how to put the tongue in the face and all that in order to be able to make these sounds and then once they get it now it's reflexive but around puberty if you have a male child their voice starts to change somewhat uh, because of testosterone levels now testosterone can affect the vocal cords directly it can make the vocal cords get much thicker the thicker the vocal cords, the deeper the voice is going to be. The other thing that happens is testosterone affects the thyroid cartilage, and that cartilage is gonna grow. Now that thyroid cartilage is also what we would call your Adam's apple. So if you see an Adam's apple protruding from someone, it's actually the thyroid cartilage. And with males, that gets much bigger because of the exposure to testosterone as they go through puberty. Now one of the problems is though, uh, when the male gets a spike of testosterone, that thyroid cartilage will pull forward. And as it pulls forward, it pulls on the vocal cords. And this is where you hear the little boy's voice, you know, do that twang thing, okay? And uh, that's because all of that is changing in there as uh, you know he's gone through this puberty stage. Now, looking down on the larynx, okay, these are the vocal cords here, 
And again, the air is passing through, coming up through the larynx, making these vocal cords vibrate. Now, if you use your vocal cords a lot, so maybe you're, you know, like a teacher or uh, you're an opera singer or something like that, those vocal cords are vibrating all the time. And sometimes what will happen is the edges will start to hit on each other. And because of that, the vocal cords can get really sore and they can start swelling up. And really, the only cure for that is to uh, shut up. <laughs> you just have to stop talking and let them just come back and heal, you know, drink some warm tea or whatever, help to take the swelling down. But some people, they like need to keep talking. They can't stop talking because like maybe it's part of their job or something they can't take off. I'll give you a story. Uh, this happened probably before most of you were even born. Uh, but in California, way back when, we had a governor whose name was Pete Wilson. And uh, Pete Wilson was a pretty popular guy and a lot of people thought that he was eventually going to become president of the United States. And so Pete Wilson decided he was going to go around, you know, doing the campaign thing and talk and all kinds of stuff. And he got a sore throat and his vocal cords were all swollen. Now, if you don't be quiet, if you don't stop talking, what will happen is you'll start growing these little, what we would call nodules, these little growths of the connected tissue along the edges of the vocal cords. And now those little growths hit on each other as you talk, and that is very, very painful. And uh, again, you've got to be quiet. You've got to stop talking. But if you can't stop talking or you refuse to stop talking, there is a surgery that can be done. And you can have those little nodules cut off of the edge of the vocal cords. Now, Pete Wilson was told, you need to stop talking. And he's like, look, I'm running for president of the United States. I can't stop talking. I need to give all these speeches. I need to keep going. Cut these suckers off. And so he went in for surgery. Problem is, if you even slightly nick the edge of one of those vocal cords, it can change your voice. Now, obviously, we don't have a President Pete Wilson anywhere on that list. <laughs> um, so something happened when he went in for surgery, and even though he had one of the best surgeons around, they slightly nicked the edge of one of his vocal cords, and now Pete Wilson, who is never seen talking in public, uh, talks like Mickey Mouse. So it completely ended his career and some totally unknown bozo nobody had ever heard of from some podunk South Arkansas, who cares, state named Bill Clinton took over. How weird. Probably would not, probably would not have beat Pete Wilson because he was so well liked and so well known. But who is going to vote for a guy who sounds like Mickey Mouse? Absolutely nobody. We would vote for Mickey Mouse as Americans. We would do that because, look, we voted for Trump. We would vote for Mickey Mouse, okay? And I heard that the next president of the United States is going to be The Rock. I would vote for him just so I could look at him, okay? I don't care what he stands for. He's got the woman's vote as long as he gives speeches with his shirt off. That's all that man's got to do. Check. I voted for him, okay? Uh, anyway, yeah, I already see it all over Facebook. The Rock for President. I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to look at YouTube and see. I'm not sure. But he really does sound like Mickey Mouse. He really does. Well, when it gets cut, will everybody's voice sound like Mickey Mouse? No, no. You, you can have the, some people, they squeak in different ways. But, I mean, it just ruins your voice. And it's just the slightest little nick. So you're best off, you know, just talk, talk. like writing on a piece of paper and not talking. Yeah. yeah. He should have had somebody else go out and campaign for him. But, you know, that it's not the same as if he did it. Um, when you talk about, like, um, boys' voices changing, like, you know how some guys that still have like a high pitched voice. Yes. Is it that their vocal cords didn't thicken up enough or it's not enough testosterone? It, it, they didn't <laughs> thicken up enough because they didn't have as high levels of testosterone. Okay. Yes, that, that is typically the reason why. Mm -hmm. Now, the air is going to go from the trachea, or excuse me, from the larynx down into the trachea. And if you remember from anatomy, you know, you've got the trachea. It's not very long, maybe about four inches long. It's got some C-shaped rings going on here. Uh, and it's got a little uh, piece of muscle to hold that C-shaped cartilage ring in place. 
And then I just, you don't have to write this down, but I just love saying it. It is lined with pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Oh I just think that's so cool. I, I just love that name. Okay, it's just me. All right, but here's the big deal. Your trachea is lined with cilia, okay? And that is very important for you to know uh, because this is another protective mechanism very similar to the nose. So what's going to happen is this cilia is going to help us to keep dirt and debris, whatever it is, from getting into the lungs. So what the cilia does is it's totally beating upward all the time. And we make a little bit of mucus in the trachea as well. And so whatever the nose didn't catch, or maybe I'm breathing through my mouth and didn't catch anything, the trachea hopefully will catch. So all those dust particles will get stuck in that mucus, and then the cilia will beat it upward, and then you're slowly swallowing that all day long. You don't even know that it's there, unless you're like nasty and you know, hawk it out the window or something like that, anyway. Uh, but that cilia is very important. Now, the cilia, I will tell you, is super duper sensitive to what we would call particulate matter. So particulate matter would be like dust in the air, or if somebody took baby powder and pushed it into the air and you got all this baby powder in the air, that's considered particulate matter. And if the cilia is exposed to too much of this at one time, they'll, they'll freeze, they'll become paralyzed. It's like they're overloaded, they don't know what to do. So for instance, if somebody smokes, now it doesn't matter what they're smoking, they can smoke marijuana, smoke speed, smoke cocaine, smoke cigarettes, absolutely doesn't matter because that's a lot of particulate matter when you're smoking. What it does is it paralyzes the cilia. So for instance, uh, let's say somebody is smoking a cigarette. If they smoke a cigarette, okay, just one cigarette, your cilia, that person's cilia will be paralyzed for one solid hour. So that means all the particulate matter that they just smoked, and there's a lot of it from cigarettes and speed and marijuana, but all of that will go down into the lungs. And that lung tissue can become damaged from that. And so you can cause, especially if you're doing this over time, you can cause a lot of damage. So when people say to you, uh, well, marijuana doesn't cause damage, it doesn't cause cancer, it doesn't cause, it, it is not true at all. Because just, if we just talk about this, Marijuana, just like cigarettes, has a lot of particulate matter, okay? A lot of chemicals float down into the lungs because it paralyzes the cilia. And it gets deep into the lungs and eventually, we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go along, but it will destroy alveoli, okay? And if the alveoli are destroyed, you can't breathe, you can't exchange gases. And this is um, part of, we'll talk about the rest later, but this is part of the disease of emphysema. Question? Um, is, is it the same with secondhand smoke? Yes, it is, depending on how much you've been, you know, uh, exposed to. So, for instance, uh, people who used to work, like maybe a bartender or whatever, in a bar when everybody was allowed to smoke, those people were much more likely to develop emphysema than even the smoker who was there for that day because they were constantly exposed to all this particulate matter in the air. Now, if I'm in a car and uh, somebody's smoking in the car and it happens to me one time, I'm not gonna get emphysema. But if I'm a little kid and my dad smokes all the time in the car, can I develop problems from that long term? Oh, heck yeah. Yes, yes, it doesn't matter what the particulate matter is made of. For instance, we don't even have to talk about cigarettes or vaping or marijuana. Uh, just stand outside in the high desert when it's windy, okay? And you're breathing all that dust and everything in, you probably paralyzed your cilia for about an hour. So anything that basically overloads that cilia, they're just like, okay, I'm out of here. I, I gotta take a break, this is too much. And then of course that can cause damage to the lungs. Question? So cilia is supposed to be the secondary um, protective mechanism right. to keep out um, bacteria and, and bad things into the lungs, correct? Right. Um, so as far as the adenoid and the tonsils are concerned, are, do they just not do their job very well? Or are they, are, are they just not as easily susceptible to They do their job just fine. 
But if I expose myself to a lot of particulate matter, they, they can't keep up. So they can only do so much. So that that's so we have to have multiple mechanisms. So you have the nose, you have the tonsils, you have the cilia and the trach. You we have multiple mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, one, one more question. Yeah. When it comes to the tonsils, they're they're constantly recommended for people to remove them. Yeah. Why? Well, okay. The medical profession swings back and forth. So for a while, remove tonsils. For a while, don't remove them. Now we're back to, okay, remove them. You have lymph nodes, lots of lymph nodes, hundreds of them throughout your whole body. So if I take one or two out, it's no big deal. Uh, your appendix, nothing but one of hundreds of lymph nodes in your intestines. So if I clip your appendix out, no big deal. One is gone, you've still got hundreds more. So the problem is when somebody's tonsils need to be removed, it's because those tonsils are failing. There's something wrong with them. Uh, they're not working appropriately. They are overloaded with bacteria. They can't keep up the job. And I uh, give the person antibiotics to get rid of the bacteria because the tonsils can't do it. And then the tonsils come right back with another bacterial infection. And so if the patient has infection after infection after infection, then it is more healthy to remove those tonsils because now they've just become a house for bacteria. And so it's better to remove them because one of the other problems is those tonsils can swell up also. And they can get so big, they can fuse and close off your throat and you can't breathe. So you do not want that to happen in your patient. So it really depends on the doctor. Some doctors are right at it. Okay, you've had three infections. We're getting rid of these things. Some doctors, oh, you've only had 12 infections. You'll grow out of it. You'll be okay. It just, mm -hmm. it kind of sort of depends. Um, the other problem is too, especially if you have little kids who have a lot of infections in the tonsils and potentially also in the adenoids, you'll really know that they're swollen all the time because they snore horribly really loud, loud snoring. So that tells you there's a lot of swelling typically in those adenoids. And the snoring indicates they're not getting as much oxygen into their body as they need. So they have hypoxia, which is very bad for tissue health. You need to get that oxygen up. So many doctors say, well, that snoring is so bad that it's causing other secondary problems. So we're taking them out. When like you're a kid and you say your parents Yes. Because are a defense, right? Yes. Just growing up, I have strep throat, like literally every month. Yes. And they're like, oh, we don't know why. You're just a strep throat carrier. So my mom would like have her window this much crack and smoke like five cigarettes. And, and it can lead and to then. asthma, and it can lead to all kinds of long-term bronchitis problems and pneumonia problems in kids. There's just all kinds. Because remember, those kids, your lungs are still developing. Everything's still developing, and now you're overloading them with all these hundreds of chemicals that we don't even know. I mean, in cigarettes, for instance, there's cyanide. What is that doing to that child? Well, it's like, like being a strep carrier. Is that like a real thing? Yes. Just like what I just said to Josiah, is that what happens is your tonsils don't have the ability to totally fight off the bacteria. So they're always kind of hiding out there. And as soon as you're off the antibiotics, they come right back. And then you've got another infection. And you said that some doctors say you grow out of that, though. Like, yeah. Does that, does that happen? Or they just say that to make you feel better? <laughs> sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. So you just, you know, these are decisions you have to like kind of make for your child and for yourself and sometimes you know it takes the stomping of the foot to get what you want you know so you've got to keep those things in mind all right so now from the trachea we're going to go into the bronchi now the trachea has c-shaped rings okay because remember the esophagus sits behind that trachea so we got the c-shaped ring with the esophagus behind so when you eat things, okay, it's going to push into the trachea. The esophagus will push into the trachea instead of pushing backwards. Because what's behind the esophagus? 
your spine, your spinal cord. So when you eat food, you've got to be able to push into the trachea instead of pushing backwards because, you know, like, you could be swallowing food and it would, like, do this, you know, as it goes on down because, you know, stimulating your spinal cord, okay? But here's a problem. If I eat food and I don't chew it right and it gets pushed into the trachea, I, I can choke. Uh, this is what we call a cafe coronary. And you need to know this, okay? Because most people, when they choke on something, okay, now watch this for a second. When they choke on something, it gets stuck right about here. You've probably choked on something and it's probably gotten stuck right about here, which is right about where your heart sits. So you're sitting in a restaurant and somebody is choking and they do this, because this is where it's painful to them. And you, the medical professional, goes what? If I did this, you would think Heimlich? Or would you think heart attack? Because I'm gripping my chest because I'm in so much pain because the food is stuck right here. What I should be doing is indicate to you like this, that I'm choking. But of course, I'm in so much pain, I don't think, so I do this. So y'all are giving me CPR when I got a piece of food stuck in my throat and it just doesn't quite work. I need that food out of my throat because it goes into the trachea and now I can't breathe. And you know, that's, that's a big problem. And so a lot of people will die from that because they have these cafe coronaries. So you have to be aware of that. Now those C-shaped rings turn into O-rings when we get into the bronchi. This helps to always keep them nice and open. And then the bronchi divide so we got the primary device to the secondary, and secondary divides to the tertiary, and then the tertiary <coughs> divides, and the bronchi just keep dividing and dividing and dividing until we get into these little teeny tiny tubes, which are called the bronchioles. Now, here's the difference I want you to know about the bronchioles. They don't have any cartilage around them. They just have smooth muscle. That smooth muscle, like all smooth muscle in our body, is extremely sensitive to epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epi and norepi do what to smooth muscle? Does it make smooth muscle contract or relax? Really? So we talked about blood pressure and I said epi and norepi bind to the smooth muscles surrounding arteries. Do arteries get smaller or bigger? Smaller. So epi and norepi cause smooth muscle to contract. So we have some people, usually uh, it starts in childhood, we have some people who will be extremely sensitive to levels of normal levels of epi and norepi. And because of that, it will make their bronchioles smaller than they should be. And they have difficulty breathing. Now it's a little bit easier to suck the air in and much harder to blow the air out. And so you'll hear these people breathing in very deep, but as they breathe out, they have this kind of wheezing type of noise as they breathe out, we call this asthma. And when these children or even adults with asthma, when they get stressed out, when they do a lot of types of different exercise, epi and norepi goes up, and when it does, it causes their bronchioles to constrict, and they have what we would call an asthma attack. Now, by the way, usually asthma does not occur or start in adults. I shouldn't say occur, but it usually doesn't start in adulthood. So you typically have asthma starting as a kid and grow up with asthma. And you don't get it in adulthood, um, usually. So if you have a patient who, let's say, is 25 years old, comes into the emergency room, and they have asthma-like symptoms, one of the things you should find out for them is how stressed out they are. The second is, have you had asthma all your life? And if they say, no, this is the first time I've ever had an asthma attack, um, they're probably a college student with a lot of stress in their lives, so that their epi and norepi levels are super duper high, which can cause you to have an asthma attack. You don't have asthma, you've just had a type of asthma attack. Yeah, April, question? You said the bronchioles don't have they don't have any cartilage, they just have smooth muscle, the bronchioles. No cartilage, just smooth muscle. So they're controlled by epi and norepi. All right, so one other thing before we 
take another break. I want to talk to you about is the um, uh, the membrane that surrounds the heart. Now you know with membranes we've got a couple layers. We have visceral membranes and we have pleural membranes. And in this case, or sorry, I'm sorry, parietal, visceral membranes and parietal membranes. And in this case, the visceral membrane is the visceral pleura, and it is directly on the lungs, right? Attached to the lungs. If you tried to pull this pleural membrane off, you'd rip lung tissue off with it. It's so sealed. Now, then we also have the parietal pleura. Where is that attached? Say it again. On the visceral pleura. On the visceral pleura? No, it's on the cavity. It's on the cavity? Um, you're all right. You're correct. Uh, but I want to kind of get this in your mind so that you understand it is on the visceral pleura and it's on the cavity. Okay? It's the both. And this is really an important concept. So let's go back to the fetal stage of development. Baby's inside mom. Baby is not breathing. It's just a little fish swimming around in water. Okay? And one of the things, if you could look at this fetus, is that its chest is not out. Its chest is actually a little caved in, okay? Because they haven't taken their first breath. And that's what kind of pops the chest out, is with that first breath. All right, so now you have inside, you have the lungs. So let's say this, these are the lungs. And then directly on top of the lungs, you have the visceral pleura, right attached to the lungs. Now, attached directly to the visceral pleura is the parietal pleura. They are attached to each other. Now the lung cavity is caved in. So guess what? Right attached to the parietal pleura is the lung cavity. So you have the lungs with the visceral pleura on top, the parietal pleura on top of that, and then the chest cavity right on top of that. They're all on top of each other. Okay? So. If this is the lung, you have the visceral pleura right on top. And then attached directly on top of this, directly on top, is the parietal pleura. And then, directly on top of this, let's see the best way to do this, I'll just fall it across. Is the thoracic wall. So they're right on top of each other, stacked right on top of each other. But now, the way that they're situated, because the cage is bent in, it's like this, okay? And they're all stacked right on top of each other. Now this baby's gonna be born, and the second the baby's born, he or she is gonna take their very first breath. Now all these membranes are attached to each other, and the baby takes his first breath and is gonna fill the lungs up. Okay, now watch what happens as the lungs fill up with air, everything rises out. Everything now pulls out. So your lungs, okay, depending on how thick your pectoral muscles are, but underneath your pectoral muscles directly attached to the thoracic wall are your lungs. They are right there, okay? So if you don't have really thick pectoral muscles and you were to put like a, a probe right through, you wouldn't have to go more than a quarter of an inch through the wall to get to your lungs. They are right underneath. And what happens is because these membranes are attached to the wall of the thoracic cavity, they hold the lungs open. If you cut all those membranes off of the wall of the thoracic cavity, the lungs would collapse. But because the membranes are attached to the lungs, and attached to the thoracic cavity, it holds the lungs open. And of course, they're attached all the way around, in the front, on the sides, in the back. And this is what is holding your lungs open. So for instance, if you have a patient who comes in and they've been stabbed, and some of these pleural membranes have been torn, you could have a collapsed lung. 
Now the nice thing is our lungs are built in such a way that even though we've got like three lobes over here and two lobes over here, these lobes are actually separated. They're not full lobes. There are little segments in between. And each lung is separated into about 23 different segments. So if your patient is stabbed in the upper segment and the pleural membranes tear, only that upper segment will collapse. The rest of the lung will stay open. Anytime membranes tear, so for instance, you could even have a patient who has pneumonia and they're coughing really, really hard. That could make their membranes tear and that area of the lung could collapse. If an area of the lung collapses, we have what's referred to as a pneumothorax. Now they're pretty easy to fix, okay? All you're gonna do is you're gonna treat them kinda like a balloon. You're gonna put a tube in there. You're gonna fill them up with air. And then all those membranes are very, very sticky. So the minute you fill that lung with air, it'll stick right to the wall of the thoracic cage again. Now if there's a hole from the outside, you gotta patch it up so that the air can't leak. If there's not, you just have to go in and fill that segment of the lung with more air and it will stick immediately to the wall of the thoracic cage and the lung will stay open. Is pleurisy when the lining of the membrane strips? No. Oh. Pleurisy, okay, so in between the viscera and the parietal pleura, there's a little bit of fluid, okay? And it's a, it's a thick fluid, kind of like the consistency of uh, egg whites. It's a little thicker. And so as you're breathing, those two membranes rub on each other. And you know, if you do this all day long, 18 times per minute, you're gonna have a lot of friction and it's gonna burn. So we put a little oily substance in between so the visceral and parietal can rub on each other without problem. But sometimes people will get um, viruses, bacterial infection, even an autoimmune disease called lupus, where they don't make enough of this fluid, what they call serous fluid it goes away, and so when you breathe, now those two membranes rub on each other, the person gets a lot of friction, and with every breath, it's hot and painful. And, but typically, most often, pleurisy is due to some kind of infection, viral or bacterial. Any other questions? Yeah. So when the lungs collapse, does, um that portion that actually collapsed, it, it no longer functions. Yes. At what point does that um, portion of lung um, not ever it, function again? Uh, well, you know, you're probably going to come in pretty quick when something like that happens. Uh, but I would guess if you let it go for more than a couple of weeks, you're not going to be able to fix it because you're going to get connective tissue growing in there and alveoli collapse. So probably need that person to be in there right away. And it's very painful. This is not something you want to deal with. So most people will go in and have it cared for.